So I wanted to welcome everyone to this month's webinar, which is Advanced Parkinson's Care and Estate Planning. My name is Nassim Jamal, and I am the Senior Manager of Donor Engagement at Parkinson Canada. I know that everyone is probably really eager to get started, uh, but I wanted to go over a few housekeeping items before we start. You will see at the bottom of your screen a Q&A as well as a chat function. If you have any questions for any of our speakers, please write them in the Q&A. We will have some time at the end to answer some of these questions. The chat function, which is different from the Q&A, is only really there if you would like to talk amongst yourselves but any questions written in this chat will not be seen by our panelists. So I really encourage you to write your questions in the Q&A uh, section. So now let's get started. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Sean Udo. Dr. Udo is an assistant professor in the section of neurology Department of Medicine in the University of Manitoba Ratty Faculty of Health Sciences. After completing his medical degree and neurology residency at the University of Manitoba, Dr. Udo completed a fellowship in movement disorders supported by Parkinson Canada at the University of Toronto. Dr. Udo now practices neurology at the Movement Disorders Clinic where he has a special interest in Parkinson's disease, cognitive impairment related to movement disorders, and in patient education. As program director for the Neurology Res Residency Training Program and course director of the Undergraduate Medicine Medical Neuroscience course, Dr. Udo is heavily involved in medical education fueled by a love for teaching. Outside of work, Dr. Udo is a father, husband, ultimate Frisbee enthusiast, amateur chef, and enthusiastically enjoys the shores of Lake Winnipeg. Welcome, Dr. Udo. Thanks, Nassim. So I'm just going to share my screen here, and then I'll ask you to confirm that you can see the slides. Yes, Dr. Udo, we can see the slides. Okay, great. So hello everyone, thank you Parkinson Canada for the invitation to speak. Um, 221 par participants so far, I think this is probably the largest group I've ever spoken to, uh, but it feels like I'm just down here in my basement with my toys all by myself. So <laughs> that's an interesting experience. I can't see anybody's faces. Um, I'm here to talk to you today about uh, advanced Parkinson disease. And I gather the theme for this webinar is advanced care planning. So um, what we're going to talk about is what sorts of things you can expect as Parkinson's disease progresses. Um, I use a lot of uh, illustrations here that I drew as part of a potential project for Parkinson Canada during my fellowship and the year after. And I was going to develop this into a visual aid, but ultimately I ran out of steam. I had a baby. I took on um, several teaching roles, as you've heard about, and life just got real busy. But I still have these illustrations to use for slides. Um, so what I'm going to talk about just to start is some general things about Parkinson's disease. And if you've ever heard me speak before, uh, you'll likely have seen a lot of this stuff. But I think it's important because we need to understand the basics in order to understand uh, sort of where things can go. So Parkinson's disease is a neurodegenerative disease, which means that um, there are, uh, there's death of brain cells. Brain cells are dying earlier than they should. And this leads to shrinkage of brain areas and it leads to some of the symptoms that we have. And in particular, um, the death of brain cells in Parkinson's disease, we think, is due to accumulation of an abnormal protein called alpha-synuclein, which sort of folds up in an abnormal way and clumps together in these things called Lewy bodies. And Lewy bodies can distribute throughout the brain and 
and seem to cause neuronal dysfunction that can cause the symptoms of Parkinson's. In particular, the cells of the brain that are affected, especially early on in Parkinson's, are the ones that make the chemical dopamine. And you've heard that me say this before, dopamine is a chemical that's made by the brain and it's used by the brain to move the body. And you could think of dopamine like engine oil. So if your engine doesn't have enough oil, then the pistons will be slow and stiff and shaky. And in the same way, if your brain doesn't have enough dopamine, then the body moves slowly and stiffly and shakily. And when we run out of dopamine due to the Parkinson's changes in the brain, then that causes the symptoms of Parkinsonism. And that includes feeling like you're moving slowly, and stiffly, and shakily. So many of you will already know what we're talking about there. And this is sort of the cardinal um, features, at least the movement features of Parkinson's. Now we don't have a cure for Parkinson's. Uh, so when I talk about a cure, I talk about, for example, if you have strep throat, it's due to a bacterial infection in the back of the throat. And uh, we have a cure for strep throat. Penicillin is an antibiotic that will kill the bacteria. Um, but in Parkinson's, we don't have something like penicillin. So we can't make the Parkinson's disease itself go away, at least not yet. And of course, there's research going on across the world to try to find a cure for Parkinson's disease. But what we do have is a cough drop or a lozenge. So if you have strep throat, you can take a cough drop and that might soothe your sore throat. So it improves your symptoms, but the infection is still there. And so um, in Parkinson's, we have a pill that can improve the symptoms. And that pill is called levodopa, which really comes with carbidopa. And what it does is it replaces the missing dopamine in the brain and allows some improvement of movement symptoms. So you go from slow and stiff and shaky to being able to move better, especially at the beginning of the disease. But the thing with Parkinson's and with neurodegenerative diseases is that it's progressive with time. So over many years, and this can be 5, 10, 15, 20 years before the disease really progresses to later stages, we see that the movement will become more problematic as we progress through early Parkinson's, advanced Parkinson's, and late Parkinson's symptoms. If Parkinson's disease was just a problem where we have movement symptoms, then we might not need um, subspecialists like me. Um, but Parkinson's disease is a much more complicated condition. And the movement symptoms, the slowness, the stiffness, and the shakiness, these are sort of the tip of the iceberg. If you know much about icebergs, you know that most of the iceberg is under the water. And most of the Parkinson's problems are not as well recognized as the movement symptoms. And so these are what we call non-motor symptoms or non-movement symptoms. And these non-movement symptoms will also accumulate with time. And we're going to talk about quite a lot of these symptoms uh, as we go. It's important to note that there are probably lots of types of Parkinson's diseases and everybody also is different. So it's hard to predict who will get what sorts of symptoms at what point in time. And this slide can certainly look a little bit daunting and maybe this one with the person ending with a walker may be even more concerning, but just because these things can happen doesn't mean they will happen. So it's very hard to predict who will get what. And again, that's another area of research that's going on. This is sort of a more uh, sophisticated scientific chart from uh, the journal Nature back in 2017, very good article reviewing Parkinson's disease to mark its 200th anniversary. And this shows our degree of disability as we go up in terms of movement symptoms and as we go down in terms of the non-movement symptoms, the stages of Parkinson's. So pre-motor Parkinson's disease. So some people can have some symptoms even before they get the movement symptoms. And these can include things like acting out dreams, depression, anxiety, constipation, loss of sense of smell. And um, then the movement symptoms come and then more and more non-movement symptoms come. And we're gonna go through most of these because as Parkinson's progresses, we accumulate some of these symptoms. 
Um, and that's why we sort of need to talk about a lot of the different symptoms that can happen. So the pre-motor Parkinson's disease, I've sort of already touched on it. Often people can have constipation for many years before they're diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, as well as a loss of sense of smell and active dreaming where the brain forgets to paralyze the body during dreaming and people will act out their dreams, yell, punch, kick, thrash in their sleep. That can lead to fragmented sleep for both the patient and for um, a loved one who's sleeping in the same bed. And depression and anxiety can happen a year or two before the movement symptoms start. And that also relates to changes in the brain, loss of dopamine, but also loss of some other brain chemicals. Mid-stage Parkinson's disease is characterized by some other symptoms, including problems with blood pressure, urinary function, pain, fatigue, speech and swallowing, and motor fluctuations. And I've spoken about motor fluctuations for Parkinson's Canada before, so I'm briefly going to talk about it. At the beginning, when you start to get your levodopa treatment, you're usually taking your levodopa or other dopamine medicines three times a day. And that allows the level of levodopa in the brain to be at the just right level. But with years, the brain makes less of its own levodopa, so you often need higher doses or more regular levodopa. And the other thing that can happen is that the brain becomes sensitive to treatment with levodopa, and that can cause dyskinesia. So we can have these times where the levodopa runs out before the next dose is taken, and people can be in an off state. When they take the dose, the, the amount of levodopa in the brain is higher and they can be on, but sometimes they can be too on, so there's too much stimulation of the brain and that can cause dyskinesia. So the off state is characterized by reemergence of some of those symptoms of Parkinsonism, feeling slow, stiff, shaky. The on state is characterized by better movement. And then dyskinesia, is when people can have some writhing, twisting, dancing movements, sometimes just some head bobbing, sometimes the trunk can twist, sometimes the limb can twist. Dyskinesias are often not very bothersome to people, but they can become more severe. And if you don't know what I'm talking about when I talk about dyskinesias, if you've seen Michael J. Fox recently and for the past many years, he's had um, dyskinesias, lots of extra movements. So we're going to move on to talk about some more of the non-motor symptoms, and we'll start with blood pressure fluctuations. So in Parkinson's, you can have problems with low blood pressure, and low blood pressure causes symptoms of lightheadedness and can sometimes, in the worst cases, lead to fainting. And if you faint from standing, that can cause injury. So that's why it's important to talk about this. The blood pressure changes in Parkinson's happen typically when we're standing, when we're going from standing from either seated or lying down. And what happens in somebody who doesn't have Parkinson's is when we go from lying down to standing, the blood pressure has, the blood has to sort of pump a little bit harder to get up to the brain to fight gravity. But in Parkinson's, that reflex doesn't work quite as well. And so the blood might not get on, up to the brain and that can cause the lightheadedness and fainting. And the blood pressure fluctuations in Parkinson's is due to two problems. One is changes associated with Parkinson's in the brain, because Parkinson's can change that reflex, but also Parkinson's medication, levodopa, and really any of the other dopamine treatments can also make the blood pressure fluctuations worse. And that can lead to some warning signs. People might feel nauseous, feeling warm or sweaty, feeling faint or lightheaded. People can have blurry or tunnel vision. People can experience ringing in the ears, or they may seem to turn pale. And often people will describe this sense of dizziness. So how do we manage this? Well, the first and maybe most important thing is tell us if you're having low blood pressure. I always ask about it. And then we might review medications because some people might be on medications that lower blood pressure because in the past they've had high blood pressure and those medications may not be needed anymore. Another important thing is to prevent fainting. So you're gonna stand up slowly, don't shoot out of the chair. And before you stand up, it might be helpful to sort of squeeze your knees together uh, just before you stand and then release them. And that might help some of the blood come up to the brain. If you have low blood pressure, it's important to make sure you're drinking water. And also with water, you need salt. So if your blood pressure is low, potato chips are your friend. So would be um, bouillon cubes or Campbell's soup, things that have lots of salt in them. 
Some people will try compression stockings, but those are notoriously hard to take on and off. And sometimes you can sleep with the bed on an incline where you put a couple of blocks under the feet at the head of the bed so that the whole bed is tilted up. And that can help the kidneys to absorb more salt back into the body and keep the blood pressure. Another symptom that can happen in mid-stage Parkinson's disease is a swallowing problem. And that's called dysphagia. And these are some slides from our um, speech language pathologist who works in our clinic, Jillian Barnes, who's very experienced and kindly gave me these slides. So individuals with Parkinson's can notice changes or difficulties with chewing, eating, or swallowing. And that can really occur any time through the disease process. Sometimes these symptoms actually get better with levodopa and may get worse when the levodopa wears off. So that's an important thing to note. People might complain of drooling, slowness in eating, a sensation that food is caught in the throat, and difficulty swallowing pills. We define dysphagia as having difficulty chewing or swallowing that can be the result of reduced muscle strength, sensation, anatomic abnormalities, or an awareness of how to swallow. And in Parkinson's, it's due to slowness and some of the changes of swallowing reflexes. The risks of dysphagia are aspiration, which is when you accidentally swallow your food into your lungs, and that can lead to pneumonia. And if you swallow food towards the lungs, it can get into the trachea or the windpipe, and that can cause choking. So that's very dangerous if you have symptoms. If you start to cough when you're eating, then that's something we need to know as doctors. People might not eat as much, or it can lead to dehydration and weight not loss and malnutrition. So how can you swallow safely? Well, make sure you're sitting upright, don't eat lying down. And after you eat, it's a good idea to stay upright for a little bit. Eat in a quiet environment and don't talk with your mouth full, something that my mom sometimes still tells me to do. Oral hygiene after you eat, so you might think about brushing your teeth to get all the bits of food out of the mouth so that you don't choke on them later. Eat small bites, so teaspoon sized bites, eat slowly and purposefully, and drink water with meals. So alternate solid bites with liquid sips. Sometimes it's important to swallow twice. Sometimes after a meal, you're gonna make sure that you don't have food pocketed in your cheeks. And you might even do that with your finger or with your tongue. As Parkinson's progresses to the advanced stage, you can see that more of the brain has problems with these Lewy bodies depositing. And that can cause problems with cognitive impairment or dementia, hallucinations, and also imbalance and falls. Now in, um, so we'll talk about each of these symptoms. Last year, I guess a year ago, uh, I can't believe that was a year ago, it seems like not that long ago. Uh, I spoke for Parkinson Canada for another webinar about freezing and falls. And I, I imagine that's available on the website. So I'm not gonna talk too much about it, but we will talk a little bit about it because freezing of gait is a, an important thing to think about. And that can be sudden brief episodes of inability to step forward or especially to turn. And people will describe a feeling of the feet being glued to the floor or stuck to the floor by an invisible magnet. It can happen particularly when you're turning or when you're rushed, so don't rush. Typically, this is a later symptom in Parkinson's disease, and it may also be responsive, may improve with levodopa. It may be worse when the levodopa has worn off. And the important thing about freezing is that it's a major risk factor for falls. We don't like falls. So what to do if you're freezing? Well, first of all, don't rush, okay? That's really important. Sometimes I see a patient leaving my clinic and they feel rushed. Don't rush. It's okay if you take your time leaving my room. At home, keep pathways open, rearrange the furniture so it's not cluttered because if there's too much in the way, that can cause freezing. Sometimes there are problems stepping through a threshold, like through a doorway or off an elevator. If that's the problem, walk up to the threshold and then focus on stepping over it. Look through the doorway, focus on getting, a, getting beyond the door. That may also help with freezing. If you're in crowds, walk near walls, take slow deep breaths and focus on your feet moving and alternate between walking a few feet and stopping if you need to. If you're really stuck, you may have this problem where you can't get the feet off the ground. You can lean to one side, put all your weight on one leg and then step with the other leg. So what you see this person is leaning to their left 
So all the weight is on the left leg and then they're gonna try and step with the right. Falls are common in Parkinson's. So 90% of people with Parkinson's disease have had at least one fall. And I don't think I have this on a slide, but falls are risky because they can cause broken bones, like a broken hip or a hit to the head. Um, so we don't like you to fall. There are risk factors to think about that can cause falls. And some of them you can't change. Like for example, for some reason, females are more likely to fall than men, than men are. And Older people are more likely to fall than younger. So you can't change those things, but there are some risk factors that you can change. So anxiety, if you're an anxious person, anxiety is treatable with medications. So that's important to think about. So is depression. These are both risk factors for falls. If you're drinking alcohol, that can increase your risk of fall. Environmental hazards. So again, decluttering the house. Polypharmacy, so being on too many medications at the same time. So sometimes if you're having problems with falls, you need to have your medications reviewed either by your neurologist or your family doctor. Especially sedative drugs like benzodiazepines, sleeping medications, these can be particularly problematic for falls. If you're inactive and your muscles are weak because you haven't been getting up, that's a risk for falls. So exercise is important. Pain and arthritis can also lead to falls. And if you're doing two things at once, you're more likely to fall. So if you're walking, concentrate on walking. How to prevent falls? Try to stand with your feet a little bit spread apart. People with Parkinson's tend to have a very narrow base when walking. Stand as straight as you can, and that's hard to do sometimes in Parkinson's as the posture changes. Think about taking large steps, and you can even pretend you're marching and as you walk say left right left right that can help with freezing too and make sure that you're swinging your arms when walking because that's important to help balance and to help propel yourself forward and again don't rush at home you've got to declutter the house so here's a kitchen with lots of problems there's a carpet in the middle of the kitchen or a rug that's a tripping hazard there's pet pet food bowls those are tripping hazards right so here they've gotten rid of those things don't clutter up the cabinets, especially if it's something that you're constantly reaching into. Reaching up can be a risk for falls too. So we wanna put stuff on lower shelves and make sure that things are easily accessible. Declutter. I don't know if you can see this, but I have a problem with clutter. Um, exercise is really important. And it's really important for Parkinson's in general. So regular physical exercise, ideally you should be moderately active for over 150 minutes per week, which is about 20 minutes a day, uh, maybe a little bit more than that, get your heart rate up. And muscle strengthening is also important. And then there are different balance challenging exercises that can be done, um, like Tai Chi, dance, boxing, there are different specific, Parkinson specific programs. And you may see a physiotherapist for some specific exercises for balance. And here's just to reinforce some things about exercise. This is my little kid. It's almost three now. He loves to walk and he also loves to run. And so I have to keep up with him. And here's me back in my ultimate Frisbee playing days before I, got, before I sort of retired. Um, and here's a nice little poem that I, that I love to quote from this article talking about physical activity in Parkinson's disease. Better to hunt in fields for health unbought than fee the doctor for a nauseous draught. The wise for cure on exercise depend God never made his work for man to man. So the point of this is to try to empower you to get out and exercise if you can. Another troubling symptom that can happen in advanced Parkinson's disease is cognitive impairment. When we talk about cognition, this is the mental process of acquiring knowledge and understanding through thought, experience, and the senses. So that's me thinking about neurology, me thinking about being at the lake, me thinking about what's for dinner tonight. There are different domains for cognition, memory, language function, visual perception. So that's being able to interpret the environment, executive function, which we'll talk about in a little bit, and social cognition, which is how you behave yourself in public. Cognitive impairment is when somebody has trouble remembering, learning new things, concentrating, or making decisions that affect their everyday life. And in Parkinson's early on, remember Parkinson's is a condition of slowness, People can have slowness of thought, 
right? So it may take more time to express yourself than you used to, and you may not be able to think as quickly. And people can have problems with executive function. So what is executive function? This is the ability to figure out how to get something done when the solution is not readily suggested. So problem solving. And it's also a complex process that requires paying attention, multitasking, and organizing. So one example of something that requires cognitive function is being a line cook. So the line cook has to take orders, has to keep an eye on all the pots and pans on the stove at the same time as chopping vegetables and preparing fish and making sure not to contaminate things with the raw fish. And then there's unhappy customers and food is coming out and they're doing lots of things at once. So sometimes if you have some problems with executive function, you can't cook a big meal, like a big meal with side dishes and a main course and dessert all at the same time, that might be overwhelming. An air traffic controller also has to have good executive function. So they have to watch that the planes landing are taking off and they're on time and they have to be aware of changes in weather, delays at the airport, flocks of geese that may be flying through the radar. So they're paying attention to lots of different things at the same time. If you have problems with executive function, problems paying attention and organizing, you may have problems remembering. So, but it's a little bit different than the problem remembering you get in Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's is, is a disease where you lose the filing cabinet for your memories. In Parkinson's, the problem is that when you try to make a new memory, you might put it in the wrong drawer of the filing cabinet and can't find it later. In, Al in Alzheimer's, the filing cabinet is gone. In Parkinson's, we expect that you'll be able to remember if you're cued. So that's why writing lists, making little reminders, trying to be in a routine can be helpful if you have some cognitive impairment. Later in Parkinson's, people can have episodes of confusion. So fluctuations, just like the movement symptoms can fluctuate in Parkinson's, sometimes cognition can fluctuate. So you could have a good day and a bad day, or you could have a bad few hours in the midst of a good day where it's a little bit more confusing and you're a little bit sleepier. Visual spatial problems can happen, and that can result in problems recognizing family members, getting lost at home, having a hard time finding things in the fridge. That's a much later part of Parkinson's. Sleep problems can be associated with cognitive impairment, as can apathy, so loss of motivation, and fatigue during the day, which can be a troublesome symptom. Hallucinations and delusions can also happen. Hallucinations is when and in Parkinson's, it's typically a visual hallucination, people might see things that aren't there. And early signs of that might be looking at the coat rack and thinking the coat is a person. And that happens to all of us sometimes in the dark, but it may be more frequent in Parkinson's, thinking that there's animals in the house or people outside, or sometimes even seeing people inside the house. And if that's happening, it's concerning, and you really should tell your doctor. How to manage the symptoms of cognition? Well, we're going to review your blood pressure, because if your blood pressure is low, it can make thinking hard. Sleep. If you have sleep apnea, if you snore and stop breathing in your sleep, it can affect your cognition. Review medications. Some medications are bad for thinking in Parkinson's. Even levodopa can cause confusion in Parkinson's. There are medications called cholinesterase inhibitors that can actually improve attention, and by doing that, improve memory and hallucinations. We need to make sure that depression and anxiety are treated. If you're anxious and thinking about all sorts of things at once, it's gonna be really hard to focus on what you want to think about. And hallucinations sometimes need to be treated with psychiatric medications. It's just important that you tell your care team. At home, build in some supports. So support independence. Here's me with my grandmother baking a coffee cake. So build supports, structure and routine are important. Um, blister packs, for example, having somebody take their own medications using blister packs as guidance is an example of built-in supports. Sometimes home care can come in, sometimes moving into assisted living can be helpful. Okay, we're almost done here. What happens at the end in Parkinson's? And I think if we're talking about planning and estate planning, we need to know um, what happens at the end of Parkinson's. And I'll remind you, everybody's Parkinson's is different. Some people progress more quickly, some people progress more slowly, and it's hard to know who will get what. Ultimately, um, Parkinson's does lower your life expectancy, although there's some data that at the beginning of Parkinson's, you actually have a better life expectancy, a lower mortality rate, because you're seeing doctors more regularly. But at the end, 
you do have more risk of death. But death is not due to Parkinson's itself. It's due to either other medical problems or complications of Parkinson's. And often these are preventable. So the complications include trouble swallowing that can lead to pneumonia or poor nutrition or dehydration, constipation resulting in bowel perforation. So having a poop every day is really important. Falls with fractures, breaking a hip, hitting your head, or complica complications from immobility due to pressure sores, for example, or sometimes blood clots in the legs. Parkinson's needs a team not only doctors, but nurses, physiotherapists, swallowing specialists, occupational therapists in Manitoba, we're very lucky to have a multidisciplinary team. It's important to try and take some things into your own hands. So regular exercise is important. Eating a Mediterranean style diet, which means less red meat and cheeses and buttery baked goods and more fish and whole grains and nuts and lots and lots and lots of fruits and vegetables. And social interaction is really important which during this weird physical distancing process may have been difficult, but it's important to eat with others, to talk with others, because that's a good way to keep your mind active. Again, I talked a little bit about our multidisciplinary team, and um, I guess the last thing I'll do is just acknowledge the Movement Disorders Clinic in, in Manitoba, which is a really great place to work. I think I'm a few minutes over time, so I'm going to um, stop sharing and turn it back over. Shall I turn it back over to you, Nassim, now? Yes, Dr. Udo, thank you um, very kindly. And uh, thank you so much for being with us and um, doing the presentation. I know you had three hours worth of lectures before that, so really appreciate it. Um, what uh, I also loved about the presentation, um, was uh, you know that you you actually shared some very pragmatic tips uh, around all of the possible symptoms from you know how do you manage falls to how do you manage dyskinesias to ensuring that you have you do exercise in order to manage symptoms to absolutely ultimately having a team around you to help manage so. Thank you for all those pragmatic uh, tips um, and thank you for being with us and hope you can still stay on as we will have some questions at the end. I'll, I'll be here. Okay, awesome. Thank you. So I am going to switch gears now and I am privileged uh, to introduce you or to hear from Alice Betty Rustin. AB, as we fondly call her, was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease about 11 years ago. Even before her diagnosis, AB was involved with the Park Parkinson community. Since 1988, she has volunteered with us and has served on the served the patient community in Toronto and Guelph, including facilitating support groups, connecting with and supporting newly diagnosed patients learning, educating herself about the disease, and getting involved with clinical trials. She will talk to us today about some of the pragmatic tips on how she deals with her advanced symptoms as for Dr. Udo. I am so happy she's here with us today as well in the audience. She is a true warrior, and I have personally benefited from her wisdom and kind words. So thank you so much, um, A.B., for doing this recording for us. And I will pass it on to Allison to start the recording for us. So hi, everybody. My name is Allison Lee, and I am the lead of programs and services at Parkinson Canada. And I am so thrilled to have A.B. Rustin joining us today. We just want to say welcome, A.B., and thank you so much for joining us and sharing with everybody about your journey with Parkinson's disease, uh, what it's been like, and even for yourself, how you've prepared along the way. Um, so I think that's enough talking for me. I would love, A.B., if you could introduce yourself to us. No. Yeah. I'm A.B. I'm a. Rustin. I was diagnosed with Parkinson's. 11 years ago, but I've been involved with Parkinson's since 1988. I was in New York doing a course 
and one of my patients had Parkinson's. And I didn't know a lot about Parkinson's because I was involved with Alzheimer's. So I did a lot of reading. I really liked him. I loved his sister. She came to see him every week. But uh, through all that, I, uh, I ended up with Parkinson's myself. It was the strangest thing. I, this little finger just did, did this. Mm. And uh, I was having lunch with my girlfriend on my birthday, which is in December. And uh, she didn't say anything to me, which is she's a nurse. And she didn't yeah. say a thing, which was very interesting. I didn't say anything and I, I sort of kept doing this. <laughs> you know, you can, you can hide a little finger, you can't hide a whole head. So. Uh, wow, Libby. so that 11 years ago, you were diagnosed. Can you share with us what your journey has been like as you have aged with Parkinson's? Yeah. Um, it was pretty easy the first four years, maybe even five. I um, I still traveled. Uh, I traveled with that girlfriend who's a nurse, and because uh, I didn't ha I didn't always have tremor or didn't always have other uh, like balance. My it was normal so. I was pretty slow getting worse. But then all of a sudden in the last two or three, three years, I guess, I, I got considerably worse. Have you found that there's anything that you've done for yourself the last two to three years, as you may have noticed that symptoms may be getting worse that has helped for yourself? Well, I should be doing exercise, but with COVID, they, I was doing exercise downstairs. We had a, a, a physiotherapist come in mm -hmm. and she uh, she was there three days a week. So I'd go at least twice a week, sometimes four, three times. And it was very helpful. And now I'm not really doing much of an exercise except for walking. And that's not very good. I use my walk on there all the time when I go outside the apartment. Mm -hmm. But the best thing of all is I live in a in a seniors building that has uh, uh, that, that has uh, a company called Kane's Kane's Home Support, and so I get mm -hmm. I get a PSW for every meal. Uh, I get uh, Meals on Wheels from uh, from uh, Red Cross. They're twice a week and they they last me for two meals because you're far too big. Mm. But um, so that that's interesting. And I have I have somebody comes and gives me a shower. Somebody just picks up my laundry on Monday, brings it back on Tuesday. But it's really wonderful service. Yeah, so absolutely. I'm, I feel quite lucky. Yeah. Yeah, so that supplementary help and that support from Canes and those services makes a big difference, it sounds like. It does, indeed. So, and I went and had my will done about five years, four or five years ago, my power of attorney and my, I also, my late, the lady who lives right across the hall was a friend of mine before I moved in and she worked at Canes too. I worked at Canes before I came here. Okay, wow. <laughs> small world eh? that is a small world uh, that's amazing um ab is there anything looking back on your journey or for those individuals that perhaps have been diagnosed right now or have been diagnosed the last 10 years are there is there anything that you would want to share with them from your own journey um Sure, I ran a support group for uh, four years, uh, which which was very very um, very helpful because I had to do a lot of reading all the time. It was with um, our boss was uh, Nassim actually, the one who's running tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, and, 
she was she was helpful. Um, I ran it with this uh, nice fellow, and then he and I stayed friends for for quite a while because we danced as well at the at the uh, national ballet, mm -hmm. and that was kind of. Uh, that was a lot of fun, and and it was very good exercise. It was, I would really wish I could do it now, but uh, it's a long way to go down there. I just can't do that anymore. Yeah, absolutely, and I think hopefully for a lot of people as well, especially with COVID, hopefully being able to get back out and exercise and get out a little bit more, even for yourself when you talked about the physiotherapy lady will um, all start to take part again as well. And one thing yeah. I should tell, tell you is uh, I went to all the conferences and and you learn a lot going to conferences actually. So I was at this one in uh, in Toronto and this, this fellow was talking about the sense of, our sense of smell. Well, I had lost mine years before and I thought, Hmm, that's interesting. What if I get Parkinson? You know, I just said it. I had no. I, I'm. I didn't get Parkinson's for another five years. Yeah. But uh, I thought that would have. That's very interesting. You know, maybe I should talk to him. But he stuck out. He's from yeah. Halifax. Wow. Yeah. No, that are those are great recommendations. I think that education and awareness and getting involved and reading up on things and getting connected with people. Um, it sounds like it made a big difference in your life. Yes, it did. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you so much, A.V., for joining us today, for sharing your story that we get to hear from you, uh, that people get to hear about your journey and what it was like and how it relates to themselves as well. Um, we really, really appreciate it. And we want to thank you so much for your time, A.B. You're most welcome. A.B., I also uh, wanted to say thank you very much. I have had the privilege of knowing you for about, uh, about 10 years. And I can certainly attest to the fact that is, it is your uh, focus on learning about the disease, about intervening when you need to intervene, staying connected and exercising that clearly have, um, have made you live well with this disease. So, and thank you for being with us here today. So we are going to uh, switch gears and I would like to introduce you to our final guest speaker today. Her name is Erin Burry. Erin is an entrepreneur marketer, formal, former journalist, and startup advisor. She is the co-founder and CEO at Willful, an online estate planning platform that makes it easy for Canadians to create a will in less than 20 minutes. At Willful, she's responsible for driving the company's mission to make it easier for Canadians to prepare for and deal with death in a digital age. She previously spent six years running a Toronto-based creative communications agency, and she was on the founding team at startup publication, Better Kit. Erin is a frequent speaker with Speaker Spotlight and has appeared in, publica in publications, including the New York Times, Forbes, and CNN. She is the co-chair of the Tech for Sick Kids Council at Sick Kids Hospital, and she's on the board at Save the Children Canada. Erin, welcome, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you so much, Nassim, and wonderful hearing from Dr. Udow and from AB, really inspiring stories. I'm just going to uh, share my screen here. I have a little bit of a deck to run through. And I want to thank everyone. I know I'm the last speaker, so I will uh, try to get through this as expeditiously as possible because I know you probably have some questions for all of the participants tonight. Uh, and I just want to say thank you to Parkinson Canada for having me. My grandmother uh, had Parkinson's and so it was uh, a cause, it is a cause that's very close to my heart and uh, we're very excited to be partnered with the organization this month. 
And I'm here tonight to talk to you about a very, very fun topic, which is all about making a will. And, you know, I know it's maybe not the sexiest of topics to learn about on a Monday evening, but I promise you will walk away at least uh, with a piece of new knowledge uh, or hopefully a pat on your own back if you already have this important document in place. If you do have questions, please pop them into the Q&A and uh, we'll do our best to go through them at the end. So I'll start very quickly with a bit about the willful story. So we... Uh, my husband, Kevin, who's pictured here with me, uh, we started the company actually four years ago today, we launched, and it was really inspired by something that probably a lot of you can uh, relate to, which is the loss of a loved one. So uh, Kevin's uncle passed away very unexpectedly, and at a time when we really should have been grieving and making plans, we were really sitting around arguing and trying to find important paperwork and trying to decide what Uncle Dave would have wanted to be buried in. And it was just one of those moments that uh, made us sit up and think there has to be a better way for Canadians to easily plan for end of life. And, you know, whether you're 21 or 101, this is something we're all going to have to deal with at some point. And, and I know it isn't the most fun thing to think about, but the point of an emergency plan, whether that's power of attorney documents or a will or even an emergency fund uh, in case your car breaks down unexpectedly is to have it in place before you need it. So that's really our mission at Willful is to uh, help people across Canada put these plans in place before they need them so they can reduce the burden on their family after they're gone. When we actually look at the stats, I know Donna put a, a poll in here. How many, uh, how many people watching actually have a will? Well, I can guess that it's probably over half. Uh, our research shows that about 57% of Canadians don't have a will. And if you do have a will, it's probably like my mom's. It's sitting in a filing cabinet gathering dust. And it has been for over a decade because it's out of date uh, and you know isn't as useful as it would be if it was kept up to date as your life changed. And, you know, it's not just us regular Canadians who don't have a will. It's also some of these extremely famous folks like Aretha Franklin, Chadwick Boseman, Prince, whose estate is still winding its way through the court system, Amy Winehouse, the list goes on. So it really doesn't matter if you are a multimillionaire or not. The excuses that people use for not having a will are really always the same. You know, I'm too young. I don't need a will. I'm not rich enough to have a will. Uh, you know, I, who cares? I'll be dead anyway. And my family can deal with it. And yes, I do actually hear that one. But, you know, when we actually boil it down, there's no excuse not to have a will. This is such a simple document. It's so easy to get in place in 2021. And it reduces so much grief and burden for your family that it's one of the nicest gifts that you can give them. So I'm going to tell you briefly about Willful, but I'm going to spend most of my time today just talking about some of the basics of making a will in Canada and of leaving a legacy gift to an organization like Parkinson Canada. So at Willful, we've built the easiest way to make a legal will online in less than 20 minutes. And yes, it really does take less than 20 minutes. Uh, in terms of the process, as you can see from this video here, uh, you know, we work with a team of lawyers in each province across Canada, which you can see pictured here. They draft all of our legal content and you go through a simple Q&A format on our website. Think of it like the TurboTax for estate planning. We guide you through things like appointing an executor, appointing beneficiaries, and then we curate these uh, set of documents for you that you can see pictured here that you have to then execute on your end because as I'll get into, you do have to sign a will on paper. Uh, but that entire process can take as little as 20 minutes as long as you know uh, the choices that you wanna make in your will, which yes, is the hardest part. Uh, this is just briefly our pricing. We do have a partnership with Parkinson Canada this month, uh, so you can get 10% off any of these prices by using the promo code Parkinson Canada, which I'll display again at the end. Uh, and really, you know, my mission at Willful is to educate Canadians about making a will. If, if online is right for you, if Willful is right for your situation, great. If it's not, 
then get your will done whatever way makes the most sense for you. Uh, and I'll also include some resources if you do want to reach out to our team and ask about online wills, ask about whether your situation is the right fit for a platform like ours. Uh, so, you know, happy to go beyond today's session because I know we only have a little bit of time together. Uh, this is just uh, to show you that, you know, we've been around for, for a few years. We have really good reviews. You can check us out online. We've created almost 100,000 documents since we launched. Uh, and we're really passionate about helping Canadians get their emergency plans in order. So now I'm just going to dive into a few of the basics of making a will. For those of you who already have one, uh, this might be information you already know, but in that case, it's just reinforcing that you've made a great decision, you've gotten this checked off your list, but hopefully most of you take at least something away from, uh, from this. So first things first, what the heck is a will? So a will is a simple legal document that says who's going to get your assets and who's going to take care of any dependent children or pets when you pass away. It's really not that complex of a document. I often hear people uh, say, you know, I don't want to gather my net worth statement. I don't want to have to get all my financials in order. And you really don't have to. I'm going to walk through the three steps you need to take care of in order to create your will, but it's not as cumbersome as most people think. Why do you actually need one? Well, it, it's really for your family, not you. I already spoke about that a bit with my own personal experience. And your will is really a blueprint that your family can follow. It gives you a voice after you're gone. It removes that guesswork and arguing so you don't have to have a, a Rogers style family drama unfold in order to, um, to wrap up your estate. Uh, it reduces the amount of time it takes your family because without a will, you have to apply to the court and it just lengthens the process. Uh, if you don't have a will, fun fact, a government formula distributes your assets according to their formula. So if you really don't like your sibling or parent or that weird cousin, uh, you better check that formula to make sure that they wouldn't be getting anything or have a will that outlines exactly who should get your assets. Uh, a will accounts for common law spouses. So if you're in a common law relationship, that formula that the government has doesn't automatically account for those folks. And then finally, if you don't have a will, the court is going to have to appoint people like executors or guardians for dependent children. And it just drags out the process and may not be the person you would have wanted. So that's really the, the impetus to actually get a will in place. The when do you need one? Uh, really, you know, if you're 21 and you have $4 to your name and you live in your parents' basement, you probably don't need to start thinking about getting a will. Uh, but after you go through any of these major life moments, it becomes really important, whether that's buying a home, getting a pet, having a child, getting married, separated, divorced, into a common law relationship, moving provinces, uh, and yes, actually, you know, sometimes the diagnosis of a disease or the loss of a loved one can be a big catalyst for this as well. So um, after you go through any major life change, it's always good to reevaluate your financial situation and a will and emergency plans are definitely a part of that. So I know what you're thinking. Don't I have to go to a lawyer to create a will? And the answer is, uh, for any Suits fans out there, you could go see a Harvey Specter. Uh, but you don't have to. The, what makes a will legal in Canada is actually pretty simple. So a will has to be written by you. You have to have the mental capacity to create the will and understand its contents. You have to sign it on paper. Unfortunately, we still have to do it on paper in 2021 uh, in front of two witnesses. And those witnesses also have to sign the document. So as long as you follow those instructions, you have a legally valid will. And you do not have to visit a lawyer, although you absolutely may choose to. And when it comes to the methods to create a will, you really want to think about your budget and the complexity of your situation and your comfort level. So I'm going to go through the four ways that you can make a will in Canada from least expensive to most expensive. On the least expensive side, you have a holograph will or a handwritten will. This is literally just a will that you write with your handwriting on paper. And it's the only type of will that doesn't require a witness. So you can actually write it in your handwriting and sign it and it's completely legally valid. So if budget is an issue, 
this is free. It just costs you one piece of computer paper and the ink it takes to write it. The downside is that you may not know what to write. So a lot of people will write things like, I leave everything to my husband, but what if you and your husband pass away at the same time? What about appointing an executor? What about your dog? Who's gonna take care of them? So a holograph will is, is legal in every province except BC and PEI. So if you are in British Columbia or Prince Edward Island, avoid it. Uh, but it may not be the, the route for you if you don't know much about estate planning and you're not 100% sure what to write. The next uh, option that you have is a paper will kit. This is kind of a fill in the blanks form. Uh, you can find them at stores like Staples. You can also in some provinces find them on government websites to download. Again, very affordable option. Uh, the downside being that they're really one size fits all. They're fill in the blank. They're not catered to your situation. Uh, and you have to make sure if you are doing one of these kits that you uh, execute it properly, you know, witness it, sign it as per the instructions to make sure that it's going to be legally valid. Then you have a platform like Willful. We're not the only online will option. There are several out there. Uh, and again, these are not as comprehensive as going to a lawyer. You're not going to enter into a lawyer client relationship with us. We're not going to give you legal advice but it's much more customized than those paper fill in the blank forms. When you come to Willful, you're gonna get a very different experience on our site if you have pets and children versus if you don't. And your end resulting documents are going to be totally personalized to your situation. Uh, again, much more affordable at about $99 to start versus a lawyer's fees, but we can't, you know, write in every custom clause. And if you have a lot of complexity to your situation, we may not be able to accommodate it. Then we go back to Mr. Harvey Specter, the lawyers out there. Uh, if you're in a province like BC or Quebec, you might also be able to visit a notary. They have the power to draft wills in those provinces. Uh, and a lawyer is going to be your most expensive, but also your most comprehensive option. They are the only folks who can give you legal advice, who can sit with you and enter a lawyer-client relationship and give you advice. Uh, and they are able to add any level of customization to your documents. Now you are going to pay for that uh, and it can be expensive, especially in big cities. And you're also gonna pay every time you go back to make updates. Whereas on a platform like Willful, we offer free updates in future so you can come back anytime. But again, the point of this presentation is I hope you get a will and the method that you choose depends on your situation, your comfort level. And so there you have it, all of the ways you can do it uh, and now it's up to you to choose. So I've convinced you hopefully that you need to get a will. I've told you the different ways that you can go about doing that. Now I'm gonna walk through the three steps that you'll need to take when completing your will. And whether you're planning to create your will tomorrow or six months from now, uh, starting to think on who might fill some of these roles is a really good way to start the ball rolling. So the first thing that you're gonna do in your will is choose your executor. Your executor is the person who's going to bring the wishes in your will to life. They're going to be your voice after you're gone. So they're gonna be doing things like executing your will, handling estate administration. They're responsible for your funeral and burial wishes. They're gonna make a big inventory of all of your assets. They're gonna close your accounts and move everything into one central account pay off your debts and taxes, which sadly do not disappear when you pass away. Uh, and then eventually, once all of that is done, they're going to file, you know, final tax returns and distribute all of your assets to your beneficiaries. And they're also responsible for communicating with your beneficiaries along the way. This is a lot of work. So even a very simple estate takes 12 to 18 months to wrap up. As I mentioned, Prince passed away in 2015 and his case is still winding its way through the courts. Uh, and this can be, you know, someone you know in your life. It can be a spouse, a family member, a friend, but it can also be a professional, like a professional executor or a lawyer or a trust company. So most banks have a trust division and you can actually appoint them to handle this if you don't have someone in your life who might be able to do that. Uh, one note, if you're appointing an executor outside Canada, that can have some major tax implications. So if that's you, make sure you talk to a tax specialist about it. And it's also really important to ask them, 
if you appoint someone as executor in your will and you don't tell them about it, they have every right to decline the position when the time comes. So uh, very important to, to talk to them first and also to appoint a backup. So, you know, if Oprah here isn't able to be my executor because she's too busy, maybe I'm going to appoint her best friend Gail as her backup so that I have some peace of mind that someone will be able to do it. So the next step after choosing your beneficiary, or sorry, your executor, is to choose your beneficiaries. Beneficiaries are really the people or organizations who are going to receive your assets when you pass away. So on the left-hand side here, you can see that it can be an individual. They can be located in Canada or anywhere around the world. They can be the same person as the people you're gonna appoint as your executor or guardians. Uh, and if you're leaving money to a minor, maybe a grandchild, for example, you can also choose which age they might receive an inheritance because I know I would not have been very responsible with a big chunk of money at the age of 18. Uh, but you don't just have to leave your assets to individuals. You can also leave things to charity. Uh, this is great because it, just like while you're alive, it reduces your final tax bill. So it actually means that more money is going to end up in your beneficiary's pockets. And we really encourage leaving a gift to charity on Willful just because it's such an easy way to have a positive impact. And that's why we partner with organizations like Parkinson Canada. Uh, since we've launched, we've seen over 7,000 gifts left in wills on our platform, totaling over $30 million in cash gifts alone. So that's an amazing to see Canadians being so charitable. But only about 12% of people we surveyed said that they would actually do this. So I'm hoping that the group on this call is more charitable than most, especially because you have an alignment with an amazing organization like Parkinson Canada. Uh, and this is just a, a snapshot of our partnership on our site where you can easily select Parkinson Canada and leave a gift to them. So there's a few ways to distribute your assets. You can either leave something as a specific gift, you can leave a cash gift, or you can leave a percentage of what's left. So a specific gift would be, you know, I leave my engagement ring to my sister, or I leave you know, my prized collection of guitars to my cousin. Uh, this can really be any identifiable piece of property and it can also be an heirloom. It doesn't have to have a ton of monetary value. It can just have sentimental value. Then you can leave a cash gift, let's say $5,000 to your nephew or you know, $10,000 to a charity, for example. Uh, and again, it can go to a person or an organization. And then finally, you're going to divide up what's left by percent. This is called the residue, everything that's left after all of those other gifts have been given out. And that you can divide up amongst however many people you would like, you know, relatives, charities, whomever you'd like. So that's step two, leaving things to your beneficiaries. And then the final step when you create your will is choosing guardians for any minor children or dependent children or pets. So, uh, you know, if you have a child that's under the age of 18, then you would appoint a guardian for their care. Uh, and this only comes into effect if there's no surviving parent. Unlike your executor, this is usually someone that you know and trust because, you know, you're trusting them to take care of your children. And, uh, and I'm going to skip through a lot of these details, but if you do have questions about appointing a guardian for minor children, we have lots of resources on Willful site. I also don't wanna forget pets. They're very important family members. And so if you do have a pet, a will is a great way to appoint a guardian for their care, as well as to leave an amount of money. My mom has two horses, which are not cheap animals. So uh, she's definitely gonna to wanna to leave a, a gift to whoever's gonna be caring for them in the will so that they get the exact same amount of hay that they get now. And then once you've made those decisions, it's as simple as, making sure you execute the will properly. So as I mentioned, in Canada, you have to sign a will on paper. You can't digitally sign a will. Uh, you have to have witnesses that are not beneficiaries. So let's say I leave everything to my husband. My husband cannot witness my will, but it can be neighbors, coworkers, anyone else you'd like. Uh, and certain provinces are allowing you to do the witnessing process online. If you have questions about that, you can reach out to our team at Willful and we're happy to guide you through it. 
once you've actually signed that will and it's all done and dusted, you wanna store that paper copy in a safe place. You wanna tell your executor where it is so they can find it in the event anything happens and ensure the executor has access. So it's a great idea to put it in your safe, but if your executor doesn't know the code to your safe, then it's pretty useless. So make sure that they can find it and access it. Before I hand it back to Nassim, just one word on updating your will. I mentioned at the beginning about one in 10 wills are out of date. So you should be updating your will when you go through major life changes like moving provinces, uh, someone named in the will passes away, you get married or divorced, etc. And you can either, if you have a lawyer drafted will, you can go back to that lawyer and they'll update it or you can use a platform like Willful to execute a new will. And as I mentioned, you can make changes for free anytime on our platform. And any new will that you execute automatically revokes the old one. So you don't have to worry about that. So that's really it. I know I only had a few minutes here to share uh, the, the highlights of making a will. Again, if you do choose to make a will online with a platform like Willful, you can use code Parkinson Canada for 10% off. Uh, and I also encourage you to just reach out to, to ask any questions you might have and we'll be the first to point you in the right direction. So thanks to the Parkinson Canada team for having us and uh, look forward to the Q&A. Awesome. Thank you, Erin. Really appreciate it. Um, I think what I'm always surprised about is, you know, close to 60%, I think shy of 60% is, you know, individuals do not have a will. Um, and I certainly was one of these individuals and just wanting to let you know that the online platform is very easy to use. Uh, and it does only take 20 minutes. So really appreciate you coming out today, Erin, and telling us how to put a will together. So now I am going to actually, I have a question for you before we open it up um, to the general. Um, if anyone has a question, if I can just remind everyone to put it in the Q&A section and then I will read them out and direct them to the individual panelists to answer. So the one question just Erin, while I have you here, someone had a question about, we have two adult children should they both be executors or just one? That is a great question. Um, I'll answer it by saying you can appoint two people to be co-executors, but we, when we worked with the estate lawyers uh, in each province to draft our documents, they highlighted that that can often be a source of a lot of conflict because siblings don't always agree or two people don't always agree on what should happen to mom and dad's stuff and you know how the funeral and burial wishes should be executed. And so a lot of times our uh, legal advisors said, you know, it's better to just put one person in place to give them the decision-making power because this isn't a popularity contest. This is not, I like this child better than this child, that's why they're executor. Being executor requires a really high level of organization, of diligence, of, you know, effective communication. And so it's okay to say, hey, Joe, you actually are a lot more organized. I know you have more time and capacity because you don't have four children. Um, so I'm going to appoint you as executor, but I want you to make sure that you take into account your siblings, you know, opinion when you're going through the process. If you do appoint co-executors, you should just be cognizant, depending on how the will is worded, they'll usually have to be present physically together for things like signatures on documents. And if they disagree, it can really make the process a lot more difficult. So if you absolutely think they're both as capable and that they'll be aligned and you really want them both in that role, that's your prerogative. Uh, but just be cognizant that uh, it's not a popularity contest and make sure that you're appointing them both for the right reasons. Thank you. Um, so do, Dr. Udo, I will um, direct a couple questions over to you. Uh, the first one uh, is, does everyone with PD develop Lewy body? So I think that maybe I can some confusion there. So there's two things when we talk about Lewy bodies. So Lewy bodies are part of the pathological problem that happens in Parkinson's disease. And then I think this question might be about Lewy body dementia. So 
the mean body dementia is a different, um, it's sort of the flip side of Parkinson's. So Lewy body dementia is a problem where people will, will present with cognitive symptoms. So typically problems with environment, problems with executive functions, or problem solving, multitasking, and hallucinations, visual hallucinations, before any of the movement problems start. Um, and then later, Lewy body people with Lewy body dementia might develop some of the symptoms of Parkinsonism. Um, Whereas Parkinson's starts with the movement problems and some of those features, the cognitive and the hallucinations, those can come later in Parkinson's disease. So um, there are different conditions. Lewy body dementia is its own thing, but people with Parkinson's, uh, because of the progression of the changes in the brain, can develop dementia later in the stages of the disease again. Many years, typically a later, later problem. Thank you. Dr. Udo, you've been sort of coming in and out in terms of your sound. I don't know if it's your... Okay. It goes out. Can okay. you hear better now? Yeah, that sounds good actually right now. Wonderful. So while I have you, let me just ask you a couple other questions that we have. Uh, one of them is uh, uh, from one of our uh, attendees, uh, her question is large steps versus small steps. Uh, literature, I say, uh, says my husband with uh, LBD and Parkinson's should take small shuffling steps to prevent falls. I don't think you ever want to shuffle on purpose because to me what shuffling means is that you're not picking your feet up off the ground, which is a risk for tripping. Um, so I would think that it's still going to be large steps, but again, everybody's different. So it would be helpful to see a physiotherapist, especially somebody who has expertise in Parkinson's disease to help to sort out what the problems might be. Ultimately, the best prevention for falls is using a cane or a walker, uh, which I didn't actually say in, in my talk. So um, that's another thing that a physiotherapist might be able to give you some advice on. So I think that it would be important that, you know, literature is good, but it would be important to be assessed by an experienced physiotherapist who can then give you some advice on the best exercises to do, the best gait assist you might need, and the best way to walk. I would think shuffling is not a great thing though, if you're shuffling on purpose. Um, it's important to try to practice walking the way you would like to walk. Uh, okay, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for that holistic answer. Um, so we have another question here. Um, do you, Dr. Uh, Udo, have any suggestions on spasms all over the body? I'm not sure if they're talking about dyskinesias. Uh, the question just says spasms. Uh, okay, so one important thing to think about when we're talking about any sort of symptoms, especially movement symptoms, muscle cramps, muscle movements, pain, is it better when the levodopa is working? And is it worse when the levodopa has worn off? Because um, that, so muscle spasms, which could be dystonia, so an abnormal muscle posi position, it could be pain, could come from wearing off of the levodopa. And then obviously the dyskinesias, which is the extra ridey, twisty dancing movements can come when there's too much levodopa. So it's a good idea to keep a journal of symptoms and see if your symptoms fluctuate with the levodopa. If this sort of stuff is always there, then it might be something else. Um, so again, spasms is sort of a generic term, as you sort of pointed out in a scene, it could mean dyskinesia, it could mean dystonia, it could be a muscle cramp, right? So if you're not hydrating enough, you're not drinking enough water and you kind of cramping at the end of the night or in sleep, and that can be problematic for people. Okay. Awesome. Wonderful. So I have an exercise question for you from someone is exercise. If exercise is a benefit for the physical body i.e. the brain gym, what, sorry, so are they brain gym exercises that are recommended? 
So what cognitive exercises um, are rec would you recommend? Yeah, so, you know, th there's things like Sudokus and crosswords, and there are different apps that will claim to test your cognition. But really, what those things are doing is, is sort of helping you practice doing Sudokus and crosswords. So those don't necessarily translate into real life. So do them if you like those things. Um, but it's more important to be socially active. So having a discussion with people is a much bigger cognitive challenge for the brain than doing a Sudoku. And again, if you think about going to the gym, I mean, if you practice walking every day, it's so that you can keep walking later in Parkinson's. Um, if you're lifting weights, it's so that you can be strong. If you wanna do something for the brain that's gonna preserve some of your brain's capacity, what sorts of things do you wanna do later in life? You wanna be able to communicate with family Remember the stories that they've told you. So it's important not to cloister yourself alone. Again, COVID has caused such a problem here. Um, but talk with your friends, talk with your family, um, engage socially. I think that's really important. Absolutely, so key. Another question for you. Um, and it says, when there is a lot of stiffness and also back pain and not able to do a lot of exercises, so it's a bit of a catch-22, isn't it? Uh, what can me, what can, what would you recommend in that situation? Right. So again, if there's lots of stiffness, I'd ask a few questions. Is the stiffness better when you're on the levodopa or it doesn't make a difference? If there's pain, are there medications that can be added? Is there a cause for the pain? Do you have a back problem? Do you have a slipped herniated disc, right? Do you need to be mm -hmm. seen by your family doctor or seen by your neurologist to sort out what the cause of the stiffness and the pain is? And then again, I would suggest a physiotherapy referral. So we're very lucky here in Manitoba that we have a physiotherapist in our clinic who specializes in Parkinson's, but I'm sure um, across Canada, there are physiotherapists who do specialize in Parkinson's and your neurologists may know these people or your family doctors may know these people so that they can assess you and then give you some exercises that you might be able to do. Because look, lots of my patients can't walk, right? Even going for a long walk, that's a challenge for them, but there still might be some things that they may be able to do at home. Wonderful. Thank you. Here's a really great question around uh, management of medication. Um, so what is the current thinking about levodopa and protein? My mother takes her cinnamon every two, two and a half hours now and is in a long-term care facility. And it's so hard to fit it in between meals. So the issue is that protein can interfere with the way levodopa is absorbed from the stomach. So some people will see that when they eat a meal with protein, if they take their medication close before or after the meal, it, the medication might not kick in. Other people though may take their medication with a meal and the medication kicks in perfectly fine. So that depends on the patient. Now, for sure, if you're taking your medications every two to two and a half hours, and my recommendation is typically take your levodopa either an hour before you eat or two hours after you eat. You can't really fit it in. Mm -hmm. um, you can redistribute protein to the end of the day so that the last meal of the day has most of the protein and the other meals, breakfast and lunch, are sort of more carbs and fruits and vegetables. And that may settle some of those issues. Again, it may or may not be a problem for some people to, to take their levodopa with protein. I and see Donna is just posting tons and tons of resources. <laughs> Thank you, Donna. I'm trying to, uh, yeah, just uh, shoot out the yeah, the questions that Donna and others are not answering. So first of all, thank you, Aaron, Donna, for sort of helping manage the chat. Um, so the one thing that I was going to say about the levodopa and the protein, especially if you're in a long-term care facility, it often then is a conversation with the care coordinator um, to, you know, because often they are on a very specific schedule, whether or not you have Parkinson's or not. So that's certainly, and I know we certainly have some resources at Parkinson Canada that we can help, but it is often having a conversation with the care coordinator at the facility to see if your mom or your dad can actually be on a slightly different schedule. 
Okay, let me see if I can, um, just managing the time as well. Uh, we've talked about, I know in your presentation, Dr. Udo, you talked about freezing. Um, and I know you talked about lifting up your leg. Are, are, do you have any other advice on freezing? Uh, you know, when I did that, is that webinar available that I did? Because I covered a lot of things. Uh, I think that must have been recorded as well. Okay. Donna would probably know. Okay, Donna, can I leave that with you? And if not today, then we'll follow up with that recorded webinar uh, that talks about freezing. Okay, thank you. Um, there is a question here. If a Parkinson sufferer has to take extra salt, but lives with someone who has to limit his salt intake, what does that mean for the Parkinson sufferer to ensure that she's, she or he is not exceeding the salt level, the ex exceeding safe salt le levels in her body? Oh, okay, I think there's two parts. Well, so one thing is just have a salt shaker. Don't salt the food that you're cooking and then let the person who's allowed to have and encouraged to eat salt, salt the food. Again, potato chips are your friend, but maybe not if you have choking problems. So um, uh, I talked about bouillon cubes. Those are helpful. How do you, how do you, okay. So salt, what salt can do is raise your blood pressure, right? So monitor your blood pressure, go to your doctor, see if your blood pressure is too high, then maybe it's not good to have too much salt. It's possible to have very high sodium levels in the blood and that can cause um, other problems, like even things like seizures, but you'd have to be eating lots of salt without drinking any water. So just make sure that you're drinking fluid with the salt, which is sort of the point. If you don't have salt, when you're drinking water, the water just comes out as pee. So salt and sugar too actually helps the body to retain the fluid. And that's how we can raise up the blood pressure. I hope that answers that question. No, that was great. Thank you. Erin, I've got one for you. Um, can one produce powers of attorney through willful as well? I know you answered that, but I just thought I would open that up for the whole audience as well. Yes, I got a little eager typing in my uh, <laughs> my answers to my questions. So no thank worries. you for everyone who submitted questions. But yeah, I didn't spend much time today talking about powers of attorney. Just for anyone who isn't aware, a power of attorney document uh, is only coming into effect when you're alive, but you're unable to make your own decisions due to illness or injury. Think of it like an insurance policy. You hope that your car insurance, you never have to make a claim because you never get in an accident. The same is true with powers of attorney. You hope that you always remain, retain your own faculties and you don't have to, you know, have somebody else making decisions for you, but healthcare providers, in fact, Dr. Udo would probably say it's one of the most important documents that you can have in place because it really empowers someone to speak on your behalf. Uh, so there are two types, one that appoints someone to make medical decisions for you, one that appoints someone to make financial decisions like pay your bills or apply for disability benefits, and they do not have to be the same person. Uh, and on Willful, our $149 package includes a will and both of those power of attorney documents. They do have different names in various provinces. So uh, you might know them as a healthcare directive or an advanced directive in your province, but essentially the, the same purpose to them. Great, thank you. And I also, I'm sorry, Nassim, I was remiss not to mention Parkinson Canada does have a really great uh, will planning kit that actually guides you through a lot of the uh, points that I talked about today. And I believe Donna linked to it in the chat. So if it's something that you know you want to just organize your thoughts and get everything ready for when you're going to create your will or your power of attorney documents, you can access that document and it'll guide you right through it. No, thank you, Erin. And thank you, Donna, for sharing it. It really is a great starting document. I have one final question, um, and this is around, uh, someone's asking Erin um, if they already have a will um, and they need to update it, how does that work with your, with your website, with your uh, online platform? It's a great question. So if you have a will uh, through a lawyer, 
and you wanted to, let's say, use Willful or you wanted to go to another lawyer, you're essentially going to be starting from scratch and executing a new will. Uh, a lawyer will only update a will that they themselves have drafted. So in many cases, you know, you've moved provinces or your lawyer has retired. Uh, so in, in the event that you need to kind of update your will, but you can't do so with the original source like that lawyer, you, you just execute a new will. So you would go through the process on Willful, you would get that PDF document that we provide to you. And as soon as you execute it, it automatically by law revokes any previous version. Same with if you wrote a handwritten will, you could have written one while we were talking today. As soon as you sign that will to make it legal, it revokes the previous version. The best practice practice is to destroy any previous copies of the will because what you don't want to happen is your family finds an old outdated copy of the will that doesn't reflect your current wishes. So execute the new one, destroy the old one, call the lawyer's office, say you can throw it out. I know you're storing it in a box somewhere uh, and make sure that the most current version is the one that your executor or family knows about. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, so appreciated. I see that we're almost at 7.30. So I just wanted to say thank you to our three speakers, to AB, uh, to Dr. Udo, as well as to Aaron. Uh, really appreciate your time. Those were really helpful presentations. Um, we also uh, were not able to, if we were not able to answer all your questions, just know that uh, if your question was in the Q&A chat, uh, we have a recording of it and if we were not able to answer it, we will get back to you uh, with an answer to your question. I did also want to announce our November webinar. Stay tuned. Um, the topic will be emerging therapies, focused ultrasound and stem cells. Keep an eye out for an invitation in mid-November. I'd like to close the webinar by saying thank you to everyone for attending today's session. Like me, I hope you found this session to be very valuable. Thanks so much and have a fabulous evening. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank you so much, everyone.